Hi, I'm Walt, and this is Delta Astrophotography. In this video, we're going to photograph not one galaxy, not two, not three, not four, but over ten in a chain of galaxies called Markarian's Chain. And we're going to try to do it with a fairly minimal setup. So, let's do this. We can find Markarian's Chain tonight in the east, just after sunset, in the constellation Virgo. And there you have it. All these are galaxies. Isn't that incredible? One of my favorite parts about this little galaxy cluster are these two galaxies right here that are very close to each other and interacting gravitationally, as you can see by the warping of this galaxy right here. Now that we know where it is, let's go outside and set up. What? Okay, there is a legit tornado warning in this area, so we won't be shooting tonight. But luckily, over the past weekend, I did get to go out and shoot with a few different rigs, and I got to film one night, and so I'm gonna tell you exactly how I did that. Let's go talk about it. So let's talk about the equipment I used. Like I said earlier, I tried to use a minimal setup, something the amateur astrophotographer might have. Let's start with the telescope. I used a telescope with a 275 millimeter focal length. If you have a camera lens, that's just fine too. Something around 250 to 600 millimeters and anything in between is gonna be great for Markarian's chain. For the camera, I just use a regular Canon T5i. You don't need an Astro modified camera for this target. It doesn't put off a lot of red hydrogen alpha light. Just a regular stock DSLR will be just fine. The T5i is a crop sensor camera, so it went really well with a 275 millimeter focal length. I also tried it with a full frame camera and a 600 millimeter focal length, and the results were actually very similar. We will be using a star tracker. I'm using the iOptron Skyguider Pro. This will allow us to take long exposures because it's moving the camera along with the stars, freezing them in place so we don't get long star trails. We can take pretty long exposures uh, of the stars, but I'm not going to be using auto guiding in this particular project. An auto guider is essentially a little mini scope and a camera attached to your setup that communicates with like a computer and your star tracker and allows you to do even longer exposures. Well, we're not gonna use that. Now we also won't be shooting a narrow band, so we won't be needing any narrow band filters of any kind. Now, if you live in a city, you might wanna try a light pollution filter, but since I, I'm used to living out in the country, I don't exactly know what kind of light pollution filter to recommend. Sorry, the best thing I can recommend is get to a dark location, a Bortle 3, Bortle 4 class sky, pretty dark, and you'll get some great results out there. So plan you a little trip to a dark location. And I'll, I'll be, be there, there waiting. waiting. No, you won't. You'll be sitting in the living room, reading a book, eating cheese, and hanging out with a dog, a cat, a lizard. Want, Want some? some? No? No. Oh. Here, Here you, go. you go. So essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna take as many long exposures as possible, and then we're gonna take a few calibration frames, which I'll explain later. But after we're done, we'll stack them all in a free software for Windows called Deep Sky Stacker and then we'll just process that image in Photoshop, and that will be the end of it. It's best to go out and shoot around new moon when there's no moon in the sky. You really need there to be no moonlight while photographing this particular target. And prior to making this video, I actually went out and practiced a few nights with the big rig as well, because it's always good to have a little backup plan. You don't want to just base everything you're doing on one night, because you never know when an emergency will come up on that one night. Maybe unexpected clouds that the weather app didn't predict, or wind that you forgot to look out for or other random emergencies. Oh, that's right, it is your birthday. Well, you know, it's just that there's, there's no moon and the, the clouds, they, I, I understand, birthdays only come once a year. No, no, it's okay, I'll see you at seven. This is a Canon 6D, it's a full frame camera, a Tamron 150 to 600 millimeter lens, an auto guider, and this is an EQ6R Pro go-to mount. I know the main focus on the video is not on this rig, but I will share the results I got with this at the end of the video as well. Now let's go back a few days ago and see what I was up to out there. Okay, it's a little after eight o'clock. It's getting good and dark. I can see the North Star right up here in front of me and I've already polar aligned my star tracker with it. Basically, I just kind of looked through this polar scope and then I checked an app that shows me where the North Star is supposed to be in the scope and I adjusted a few knobs until the North Star was right 
where it needed to be inside the polar scope. And that's a short and simple breakdown of polar alignment. Then I added on my counterweight kit and my camera and scope, and now I have to balance it by loosening it, turning it to the side. If it falls one way or another, I just have to move my counterweight until it's nice and balanced like this. Now this motion is called right ascension. I also have to balance declination, which is this motion right here. So I'm just gonna kind of point the camera in the direction Markarian's chain is gonna be tonight. See that it's falling forward? That means it's a little front heavy. I need to loosen my telescope in the saddle and pull it back a little bit. All right, pulling it back just a touch, tighten it back down. Got a firm grip on the camera with this hand over here. I'm gonna point it back towards Markarian's chain. Let go. And now you can see it doesn't fall in any direction. It's just perfectly balanced. Now that I've added all this heavy equipment to my star tracker and moved it around balancing, I've probably knocked it out of polar alignment again. So I'm gonna to have to repolar align. And the way I go about doing that is to turn this red headlamp on, shine it through the polar scope so it can actually see the little reticle, the little target on the inside, look back through it and make my polar alignment adjustments. An important tool we're gonna to need tonight is an intervalometer. This is pretty much a little remote. Um, this is gonna allow us to take longer exposures without having to touch our camera. We're gonna be doing exposures of 60 seconds or more, and we do not wanna be touching this thing. This also allows us to set an interval of exposures. Um, we can set it to take as many as we want. Uh, I'm gonna to try to get at least two or three hours worth of exposures in there, so I'm gonna program this thing to take at least 100 photographs. I'm just going to stick it to the side of my tripod on some Velcro, plug the other end on the side of my camera here. I also have my dew heater because here in the Mississippi Delta it's always humid, everything is always getting wet, so this is just going to keep my telescope lens from fogging up. Also you might see a wire coming from here. This is a dummy battery that I have plugged into a little power strip, that way I don't have to worry about batteries, I can shoot all night. But if you don't have something like this, uh, it might be easy to use a spare battery. Just shoot for as long as you can on your initial battery, and then once that battery dies, plug another battery in and take your calibration frames, your darks, your flats, your bias. I'll get into those in just a little bit. My next step is to find a bright star, aim this towards it, and focus manually. Basically, I'm gonna turn my live view on and adjust my focus ring until the star is as small of a pinpoint as possible. Another option is to use a Badenoff mask. I can put this on the front of the telescope like this, and when I have my live view on pointing at a bright star, you'll see a diffraction spike pattern, and you adjust your focus ring until the stars look like they're uh, an X with a straight line through them. That's kind of the pattern you're looking for. When you see that pattern, you know you're in focus. After I got everything focused, I set my camera's ISO to a high number. I think it was ISO 6400, and I just started searching the sky for my target, taking about 15-second test shots. It took a while, but I finally found it. Once I did, I set my camera's ISO back down to about 800, yeah, 800. Then I set my intervalometer to take 200 photographs at 60 seconds. I decided to go for 60 seconds because there was a bit of wind outside and we weren't using auto guiding or anything like that and I just had a feeling that over 60 seconds would cause problems and I'd be throwing away a ton of photos because of star trails and other things. After that, I just had to go inside and try not to pass out. One hour later. Hey, hey, human, human. Aren't, aren't you supposed, supposed to be doing, doing something? something? Hmm? What? Oh, crap. Did it again. Come on, dog. Come on, fish. It's off to the moon. We go. All right. It's almost one o'clock in the morning. It made it through 177 photographs, so I'm going to stop it here and get ready to go to bed. So now I'm going to take my lens cap, put it back on. I'm going to take around 30 or 40 more photographs with the cap on. These are called dark frames, and I'll stack it together with the light frames that I just took, and the dark frames are gonna help remove some noise, especially thermal noise from the sensor heating up when I was taking the long exposures. So they need to be taken around the same time as my light frames, so the sensor will be at the same temperature as my light frames. I'm just gonna let it roll and take dark frames while I sleep, and I'm gonna get up in the morning and take another form of calibration frames called flat frames. So we'll see you in the morning. Flat frames are another type of calibration frame that you take and stack with all your other images. They're important because they get rid of vignetting and make your photo evenly illuminated from edge to edge, and they also get rid of any dust that might be on your lens or somewhere in your imaging train. Here's what an image can look like taken without flat frames. And now here's a stacked image 
that includes flats. These can be the most complicated to take, but once you get used to it, it's actually pretty easy. There's lots of different ways to do it, but what people usually do is they'll point their camera straight up like this and then cover it with either white paper or a white shirt of some kind. There's a white lab coat. Cover it and then double fold it like this. Make sure there's no creases on top. Typically people fasten it down real tight with a rubber band. I just don't have one of those right now. And then they'll aim this at an evenly illuminated light source. For example, a tablet with a solid white screen. People also use illuminated sketch pads. Um, you can get an actual dedicated flat panel, which are pretty expensive. Or what I actually use is the dawn sky, right before the sun starts rising. Now let me show you the camera settings I used to take my flats the other morning. All right, we're looking at the back of the camera now. Um, I'm gonna keep my ISO exactly the same, but I'm gonna set my shutter speed to a very fast speed. That's just gonna get me started. All right, now I'm gonna switch over to live view. I'm gonna use this info button right here to open up my histogram. All right, there it is. See that little spike there? I'm gonna move my shutter speed until that spike is about a third of the way up. Right now it's all almost all the way on the left. Let me see that's too far, about halfway. Just somewhere around here. That is around the proper exposure for a flat frame. Now I'm just gonna hold this down because I don't have rubber bands to tighten this, so I'm just gonna hold it tight like that. I don't want any creases in there at all. And I'm just gonna repeatedly press the shutter button on my intervalometer for about 30 times to take about 30 images. And that's all there is to it. The final calibration frame is the easiest. It's called bias. It's just another noise frame that can reduce noise and it's especially good to calibrate the noise out of your flats. All you have to do is put your lens cap back on. Once again, your camera's ISO stays the same. Hopefully your focus is still the same. And all you have to do is set your shutter speed to as high as it will go. One two thousandth of a second, one four thousandth of a second, something like that, as high as it'll go. And just shoot about 100 photos like that. And that's really all there is to calibration frames. I do recommend taking them if you're doing deep sky astrophotography because they will really drastically improve your images. All right, that's about all there is to that. Before I show you my final image and also the final image that I took with the bigger rig, if you wanna learn more about Photoshop processing, I already have a few videos on this channel and I'll be making more soon, so please subscribe. Also, we're now entering the very beginning of Milky Way season and I can't wait to get out there with just a camera, a, a wide angle lens and a tripod. I'll be making videos about that as well. I'm sure you'll enjoy some of that. It's much simpler than, than some of the stuff we did in this video. And if you like anything in this video, please give me a like. It really helps out the channel. I thank you guys so much. You've all been so amazing. This has been an amazing journey and I can't wait to keep it going with you. So as always, everybody, stay spacey, clear skies, and good night.